Welcome to the Sports on Tap NEO High School Football Show. Be sure to join the conversation by liking us on Facebook and following us on Twitter at SOT Podcast. Use the hashtag SOTHSF. Here are your hosts, Rob Trump, Josh Jeffy, Ed Dick, and Sean Duffy. Welcome to Sports on Tap. This is week four of our high school uh, football coverage here. We are live in Studio J. Ed Dick along with Rob Troutman, Josh Jeffy, and Sean Duffy. We are ready to roll, and uh, we're going to start off quite fast here. Uh, In addition to our normal coverage of the Greater Cleveland Conference, the Southwestern Conference, and the Suburban League, both American and National Divisions. Uh, We're going to venture down to the Dayton, Cincinnati. Uh, Sean's uh, neck of the woods down there. Yes, sir. And uh, (laughs) we're going to talk with – we're going to talk with a head coach down there here shortly just to go over the – go over the normal items here. We are uh, live on Mixler.com slash sports on tap. Uh, Check out our website, all of our recaps. Uh, this this show will be on uh, Sports on Tap uh, on our YouTube page. Uh, we go over the schedules, live scoring uh, on our Twitter handle, uh, at SOT Podcast. Check out SO, uh, sportsontappodcast.com uh, for our major write-up, which uh, we'll be talking about here shortly with the game of the week, which was the Medina Buckeye Bucks and the Lutheran West Longhorns out of Fairview. Um, so got a lot to get to here, but first uh, – we will talk with Fayetteville Perry head coach Kevin Finch um, with a uh, tremendous victory over the weekend. Coach Finch and his Rockets are 4-0 and on the year. Nice. And uh, we are lucky and uh, privileged to have uh, Coach Finch on the line with us. Coach Finch, how are you doing tonight? Good. How are you guys doing? Uh, excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. I appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, we have, um, you know, you, you guys have had, have jumped out to a quite a fast start here uh, down in Fayetteville. And uh, with this, uh, in a very, very exciting game against Hillcrest Academy, uh, a 58-56 to victory. Ooh, wow. Uh, blowing up the scoreboard lights down there. Why don't you talk, uh, <laughs> describe that game, uh, describe that game for us here and uh, how the ebbs and the flows and, uh, and, and, the, and the big stop at the end. Yeah, it was a uh, it was a game not for the faint of heart. It was uh, coming in. We were concerned about Hillcrest because uh, they they had a lot of speed and um, all they had to do is just get it click. And their kids always always play hard and uh, they really cleaned a lot of things up coming into the game. But we started out had the ball first and took a lo- nice long drive, punched it in, which is kind of our mantra. We like to control the clock and uh, possess the ball. And they came right back to return the next kickoff for a touchdown. Then we took the next drive and took it for a long drive, but turned it over and they took that for a touchdown. So that kind of gave you an idea of how the game was going to start, where it was back and forth, where we'd take a long methodical drive and then they'd score pretty quick and just kept going from uh, from that point on. And so with that with that quick strike offense that they, or, or in other ways of them being able to score, how were you guys able to maintain that pace uh, throughout the course of the game? It was definitely difficult because uh, they were putting us in a, a difficult situation. Some of the things they were doing, and uh, they're doing some reverse plays that work were working well. They get they got us with a hook and lateral, um, just a lot of a lot of things that they were executing very well. And we had to make a couple adjustments. We had to get into our uh, three four package on defense, which helps slow them down a little bit. And then, uh, of course, offensively, sometimes we had to change up the pace a bit on our own at times I felt like we were able to speed it up to try to control the game and then there's other times we had to slow it down to try to keep their offense off the field so that that helped us out a little bit yeah and it looks like in this game I think you went for four two-point conversions and I see Hillcrest also went for some uh, two-point conversions. so you guys uh definitely trying to put up some points what was uh <laughs> Do you guys usually on the first score always go for the two-point conversion, or how do you make that decision 
Um, like I said, in a high-scoring game like this, um, to go for four or five two-point conversions is almost unheard of, really, in a lot of uh, high school games. It, it is. It's funny you say that. But, you know, we have uh, four of our offensive linemen are returning starters from last year. And then our sophomore running back, Hunter Jester, is uh, 6'1", uh, 215 pounds, is in the 1,000-pound club. So wow. our, our, our philosophy is if we can't get three yards behind that, then uh, <laughs> it, that's, that's just our best opportunity, really. Yep, makes sense. Uh, uh, Coach, real quick, just you know, just talk about your team in general because obviously we're up here in Northeast Ohio. We cover a lot of the Northeast Ohio schools, so we don't talk uh, too much, with the exception of your team uh, on our show, about the teams down there. Not only your team, but the teams that uh, you guys go up against. So just talk about you know your team and and how you guys are doing. You know what you what you what your team consists of, and and some of the area teams that you know, um, are either a challenge to you or some of your big rivals? Absolutely. Well, we, uh, we just officially started football back in 2010. So we're still in the infancy stage of really football growing in this area, uh, in Brown County, about 45 minutes east of Cincinnati. We're a very small school, D six school. We have 25 guys on our roster. And, uh, just last year we got into a new league, uh, called the Southern Buckeye conference, which is a very, very strong conference. Uh, some of the teams that we play are, we're facing Batavia this week, who is also for a very strong team. And after that, we're going against our rival Claremont Northeastern and then uh, move on to East Clinton and go from there to Williamsburg. And then our last two games are, are Blanchester and Bethel Tate. And Bethel Tate was 10 and 0 last year, made to the playoffs. So it's a, it's a very grueling schedule. They're all, D5 schools were a D6 school with the exception of Williamsburg, who was also D6 with us. Coach, well, one thing I, I want to ask is, you know, a lot of these, the exception of using my microphone, uh, a lot of the. <laughs> I remember my first yeah, day. My first day on the show, I guess. Um, you know, I'm looking over your last few wins here, and, and despite last week's kind of shootout game, you, you've been playing pretty lights out defense, only giving up until last week only about eight points. Um, you know, was it was it something that Hillcrest maybe changed that you saw at halftime, or was it just you know, this you know, as any coach would say, you know, letting them make plays and not making enough plays of your own? Yeah, I think uh, I think they made the most out of a few opportunities. They were making some big plays, and and we also looking at film. There were some things that we felt like we could have done differently, but hats off to them. Uh, their their players were playing their hearts out, and then they got it got it clicking and uh, we were fortunate enough to get that stand at the very end but you know, our, our players have been playing pretty good defense taking a lot of pride in it um I was, it starts with their inside linebackers with mark wolfer and hunter jester who are both uh, thousand pound club lifters and our d line's been very strong with uh with dalton novak as one of the guys um that's really anchoring down that down that defensive line trying to make it difficult for teams to run the ball along with drew hendricks and our DBs behind them have been uh, doing a nice job of uh, knocking the passes down and picking some off when they get an opportunity. So they've been taking a lot of pride in that in our defense this year. And, and coach, you know, up here we're, we're you know with the teams that we cover, you know, they're, they're, you don't see a whole lot of uh, we, we we have a, a good amount of players on the rosters up here. And I know you've been a part of teams that have had uh, expanded rosters. You know, being a head coach of a of a of a, a Division Six school, and specifically with only twenty five players on your roster, is you, know, you and I have talked about off the air and and, and uh, you know before the season started. You know, what's the biggest difference for you uh, in some of your past coaching lives to, uh, with a bigger roster to what you what you're working with now? Oh, absolutely. the 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 first and foremost thing is uh, depth. Where I mean, we can't afford to lose anybody to an injury, and we went through that last year. We really we got hit hard with the injury bug, and uh, we made a lot of changes this year because we couldn't let that happen again. As you guys mentioned, we have a small roster of 25 players, and we need everybody contributing in some way, shape, or form from freshmen to seniors. And uh, one, we changed, you know, we strength worked with our necks much more, trying to strengthen the necks and reduce the risk of concussion because there's a lot of, a lot of. Uh, a lot of evidence to support that stronger neck, less uh, likelihood of having a concussion. And, of course, we take the head out of the tackling, which a lot of teams are doing, doing with the Seahawk uh, 
park roll tackling and all that stuff. Uh, we also we felt like we had to place a better emphasis on the weight room in general from last year. And, and one of the things we've changed this year, it's been – I did did not quite know how it would go, but it's been great is we actually lift pregame. We're, we're now lifting three days a week. It's the traditional Saturday, Monday, and Friday. We get in there and we get a light lift before the game gets going. And it's it's, it's been a great thing for us to try to help you know, boost that confidence and help reduce injuries and, and things like that. But as a small school, it's very important to – try to keep those injuries reduced because it's uh you know you just don't have any depth you know talk a little bit about um some of your players let's go through your team a little bit um you know in the last game against hillcrest um you guys racked up 385 rushing yards you talked about your offensive line let's give your offensive line guys some credit go through your roster a little bit and uh tell the people listening out there um you know your quarterback um, McCauley threw for 179 yards and three touchdowns. Um, you know, Jester's running for 271 and five touchdowns. I mean, that's he rushed it 42 times, and then um, you had another guy uh, run for 21 times. I mean, so you're you're running the football, but you're bouncing out with uh, the passing game. Tell us a little bit about uh, your team on the offense and then over on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, absolutely. Like you guys mentioned, it starts with that offensive line. They've been doing a stellar job this year with uh, going across Drew Hendricks, uh, sophomore Mark Wolfer, senior uh, guard. Uh, again, another thousand pound lifter. Dalton Novak is a six two two ten tackle who who just does a great job of taking pride and trying to get pan- pancakes and finishing his blocks. Um, Curtis Friedhoff. Uh, another junior that's been doing a nice job. These, these guys across the board have been uh, excellent job of making holes, along with Aiden Dye at center. Uh, we switched to the pistol snap this year. Last year we were more shotgun, and, and, and the pistol has been allowed us to be a little more explosive. Uh, you guys mentioned C.J. McCauley, who's my quarterback, uh, 6'6", 200 pounds. He really worked in offseason to build himself up for that, and he's wow. kind of been waiting in the, waiting in the wings for uh, – his opportunity as quarterback, we kind of call him a field general. We say he manages the game, but I don't know if that's really fair to him because he he does a heck of a job. Uh, uh, he's like a coach on a field. Uh, Bowen Doan is is a receiver, another explosive receiver that you know right about when when teams fall asleep, you know, with our run game, where he opens able to help us open the offense up a little bit. And uh, another guy that came out this year for the first time that really helped us out and. Coming into the season, I was concerned with a number of things, and we had a couple guys come out to help us out. Uh, Chris Murphy is one of those guys, a basketball player, who's another very good wide receiver that when people start locking down on Bowen, they, then uh, Chris is there to make, make some big plays. Uh, we had a couple of tight ends, a couple of kids that were wide receivers that moved to tight end this year, Nathan Kingus and uh, Brandon Fisher, that really helped us out because coming in, we didn't know who was going to play tight end. And um, and Austin Holden is another senior who's will pretty much play whatever position we ask and we move him around. Sometimes he's at tight end, sometimes he's at running back, linebacker. And I mean, when you get that type of buy-in, we only have five seniors, but the leadership's been—I can't speak enough about the leadership from those five guys and the buy-in and just their willingness to accept their role and, and take on whatever responsibility it takes for to help enable the, the team to be successful. You know, the, the leadership thing is huge, and you, you mentioned that you've been able to get some other players to come out from other sports. You know, so I, I have two questions. The first one re- is related to the to the multi-sport aspect. How many of you are the players uh, – how many of your players play multiple sports, and, and is that something as a coach that you encourage? Yeah, most, most of them play at least two, uh, if not three sports, and it's definitely something we encourage. I think there's a lot of – studies out there saying it's it's great for the athletes to work diff, different uh, muscle groups in in different parts of the season so it, in, in our small school we have to programs have to support each other like the basketball coaches encouraging these kids to play football and, and I'm encouraging them to play basketball and and having them compete in different sports uh, yearly I think is more important than just hitting the weights and in our opinion all year long and uh, you know, the second question I have, uh, you 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 have a team that started out four zero, and your program is still in its it's in its relative infancy, having started in two thousand and ten. And you know, last year 
you had, you had a successful season by all counts. What's it going to take for this team uh, to, to crack the top eight in the region and, and advance to week 11 in your opinion? Well, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's been kind of been our rallying cry for a few years now. It's something that the kids really want. They've wanted it for a few years and in our region, it's extremely difficult. We have Marion local and cold water, just to name a few. So you're looking at, there's a number of teams that you're, that you're saying that, they, they got playoff spots almost locked up going into it, and we just have to take care of our part. And then the nice thing is we do play some bigger schools, and there's some points on table. But what we need to do is just uh, take care of what we can control with our schedule and, and our team and see if we can put ourselves in a situation to sometime crack that top eight. Yeah, I mean, the, the uh, it's obviously good to get the wins. You, you, you've, you've done what you've needed to do so far. You know, as you said, we're looking at – we're looking at um, – our, uh, you know, JoeItel.com, uh, Division Six, Reason Four, as uh, as Coach Vince pointed out, Coldwater has a has nine point two five points for a Division Six school at this time of the year. That's that's pretty 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 impressive, um, and definitely not to take anything away from where you're at, Coach. You're at three point eight five points uh, as far as the, uh, the the calculation is concerned. With with some big point with some big points coming up, um, you know, with uh, Batavia, a Division Four school, four and zero, oh, lots of points on the line there. Uh, why don't you preview Batavia a little bit for us uh, going into this big week? Absolutely, and like you mentioned, they're a D4 school. They're undefeated also. Uh, very sound, well, very well coached by Scott Donaldson. He's had the program for a couple years now and, and has those kids believing and playing hard. They are, are your traditional wing tee. They're, they run the ball very well, and, and they'll throw the ball uh, when you fall asleep on them. Uh, they have a couple of really quick wings and a very good quarterback slash linebacker uh, that that uh, that just flies to the ball. Uh, is really an excellent player. Uh, they're they're like I mentioned, very well coached. Odd stack on defense, and they play hard for their coach. and, and They're an impressive looking team. What's your? Uh, I mean, what's the best plan of attack in your for your for your team against that uh, against a vaunted wing T like that? Absolutely. The biggest thing is we got to limit their big play capabilities because they, they have a couple wing backs that at any one point they can increase you on the, on a jet or rock, and that doesn't take away from their fullback who if, if you start uh, trying to stop jet or rock it too much, then he's going to hit you with trap or, or down or belly. And uh, they, they run their system very well, and that's one of the reasons why the wing tee has been so successful for uh, so many years. It's – it's just a tried and true system that that uh, works works with the execution. I think uh, Coach Boone from uh, remember the Titans would say it correctly here yeah. is uh, just like Nova, take, just like Nova can give it time, it always works. <laughs> um, <laughs> especially as long as you've been running it, uh, you know some of these other programs up here have been running the wing tee for quite a while too, and they are extremely successful at it. Um, it's just it's just a, a completely different element to prepare for a team like that. Um, as opposed to a, a spread or a pro set, um, you know, anything along those lines. Um, you know, you guys have had you guys have had success the last couple of years. How is that translating to the community that you guys are in? Um, do you guys get a lot of part? Do you guys have a? And I apologize if I, if we if the collective will be sound ignorant about this because we, you know, we're being up here and and maybe some of your you know, where you grew up. There are youth leagues around they're all around that's that that cities have that kind of feed into the high school. Uh, what do you guys got going on down there as far as, as far as the youth program, or is there a like a regional youth program that you can you you go down and connect with? Yeah, there's uh, uh, our youth program has been very successful, uh, and Jason Jester's been running that for a number of years. He prepares his kids well for for the fundamentals of football tackling and blocking and, and watching those kids come up through the system. It helps, helps prepare them for, uh, for when they get into junior high and high school and, and, and just number of things. Like I, I keep seeing the fan excitement just growing every year. Uh, as I've been here, it's, you know, just this past week, I saw the student section just going crazy. Like no other, no other game I've I remember. So it's it's built. It takes time, and we're excited about seeing how it keeps progress progressing in the right direction. 
Yeah, I mean, you, you can't think but help to yourself when you're, you know, and, and I'm sure your players are doing the same thing as, you know, what if we can get to week 11? How how nuts would it be, to, you know, even just to get there, even if you have to travel a little bit, you know, you're still playing, you're still playing beyond the first 10 games. And, you know, that, you know, even if, it, even if a conference championship doesn't happen, you still make the playoffs and that that's, you know, you can't put a, you can't put a, that's almost inval- invaluable to your, to your youth program and to your, into your community when you can crack the playoffs for the first time. Absolutely. And, we, and we've been knocking on a door a few times now and we just haven't quite, it's always been a little break here or there and, and you know, the kids want it and the, the community wants that. And we just have to keep taking it one week at a time because we certainly have a difficult stretch ahead of us. Coach uh, Kevin Finch here from the uh, Fayetteville Perry Rockets down uh, in Brown County in Fayetteville, Ohio. Um, you know, he's got two tough games coming up with Batavia and Clearmont Northeastern, uh, both of which uh, combined are a seven and one record, and uh, lots of computer points on the line. And if Coach uh, Finch and the Rockets can get those two te- get those two games, uh, I think we have a real good possibility to talk about uh, Week Eleven. Coach, anything else you want? Uh, anything else you want you want to cover um, while you're on the air? I just uh, appreciate you guys taking time and, and uh, giving us a call, asking about the Fayetteville football program. Uh, we're excited about how things are going and appreciate uh, you guys asking about it. No problem. Happy to do it. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for coming on. I hope uh, I, ho- I hope you I hope you get some run down there uh, uh, from from some of your players. I hope they uh, ho- hopefully enjoyed the show and uh, hopefully we'll we'll get back in touch with you guys with you and the and the Rockets. Uh, near the end of the season, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, hopefully we'll talk about Week 11 here in a little bit. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. That is head coach of the Fayetteville Perry Rockets, Kevin Finch, uh, on the line there. Uh, we thank him for coming on and uh, talking about a little bit about the Rockets. Yeah, and, I mean, uh, yeah. I think I think it's it's interesting to hear. You know, a smaller school. You know, Division Six. I think he mentioned, and and they're playing some really solid teams uh out his way and you don't hear about too much Cincinnati football from up here in the Cleveland area so it's it's good to see a different perspective on whether it's uh with his players you know how many teams actually I thought this was interesting lift before a game I mean like yeah, probably not heavy duty that for sure right? that's, but that that's the big one right there that's that, like that's interesting I mean who knows maybe that does work in uh you know, makes them focus and, and also maybe injury wise, they're obviously he said it, you know, they have twenty five kids on their roster. It, one injury could be huge for them. So you gotta figure out ways to, to get past that. I, I think he also brought up a really good point about his particular division and his particular uh, uh area in that it's been for the longest time Coldwater, Maria Stein. Uh, I'm sorry, Marion Local, Maria Stein, Marion Local. Those two teams have kind of been running rampant with that division and that region for so long. It's going to be interesting to see if Fayetteville can get over that proverbial hump, get into the playoffs, and maybe make some noise. But it's going to take them taking care of business like they did last week in a game that they probably weren't expecting as much That's firepower. That's a crazy game. That would have been a fun but one to watch. The three games before, they only gave up eight points. So. You know, it's it's one of those things. So you kind of have to roll with it and move on. Well, their next few games are going to be important. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, we'll see what we'll see what uh, Fayetteville Perry can do. All right, we're going to step away for a quick break. When we come back, we will recap Week Four of the Greater Cleveland Conference, the Southwestern Conference, the Suburban League, National, and American Divisions, and of course, talk about our game of the week: the Buckeye Bucks versus the Lutheran West Longhorns. We're going to do a Buckeye review. <laughs> Right after this. Are you a business? Want to be featured on Sports on Tap? Get in front of different age groups in the local community. Contact us at Sports on Tap Podcast at gmail.com for more information.
are RT Productions, specializing in creating sports recruiting videos for all high school athletes. Want to play at the next level? Promote your talents with a video to send colleges. Affordable, experienced, and a high-quality video. Make us your local video production company. Visit our website, rrt-productions.com, and contact us today. RRT Productions, we shoot, we edit, you win. of the season it's always the right time for z's cream of bean whether you want to warm up with some of their delicious soups chilies or coffees or sample from their delicious selection of ice cream shakes and other cool treats z's cream of bean has you covered visit them at 2706 boston road in hinkley ohio and tell them the guys at sports on tap sent you coverage of Cavs, Indians, and Browns, check out NEOSportsInsiders.com. NEOSportsInsiders.com brings you breaking news, opinions, and video from all things related to your favorite Cleveland sports teams. Like us on Facebook and follow at NEOSportsInsiders on Twitter for live updates from all the games. NEOSportsInsiders.com, bringing you the best in Northeast Ohio sports coverage. Listen to our shows live on Mixer or join us the first Monday of every month at Z's Cream and Bean, located at 2706 Boston Road in Hinkley. Want to listen to past shows? Go to our YouTube page or website, www.sportsontappodcast.com. SportsOnTapPodcast.com, the place to go where you can listen to past shows, read featured articles, check out all of our social media updates, plus much, much more. SportsOnTapPodcast.com, the official website of Sports on Tap. sports action including photos videos and live updates be sure to follow sports on tap on twitter instagram and like us on facebook
And welcome back to Sports on Tap, live from Studio J. It's our Ohio High School football coverage. Week four game recaps uh, here on Mixler. We're Sports on Tap. I'm Rob Traum. We have Ed Dick, Sean Duffy, Josh, Jeffy here live. And um, these all will be archived on our YouTube page. You want to follow our game of the weeks. It's at SOT Podcast on Twitter. We're on Facebook. Go to sportsontappodcast.com for stories, um, video there. Um, there are also schedules. Um, there's final scores there if you want to uh, check those out. Yes, there after are. The games. There's all kinds of stuff. So some, go go to our website and, and check sometimes it out. And sometimes the schedules are posted prior to the games being started. Not all the time, and, <laughs> which was the case for the American Division last week, which I apologize. <laughs> I forgot. Sean's ahead of the game, man. I, you know what? Really just my, my dedication to the craft, I think, is what the issue just is. Just impressive. Yeah, true. All right, well, now we had a great interview um, to start off the show, but now let's go over to Josh Jeffy, who's going to give us our week four recaps of the Greater Cleveland Conference. Yeah, it's kind of a, a change of pace now. We're in the conference play, so instead of talking about eight games, we're only really going to be talking about four as the uh, Greater Cleveland Conference started conference play uh, this past weekend. We're going to start off uh, – with the Brunswick Blue Devils, they travel to Shaker Heights, and they suffered another defeat on the season, a 14-6 loss uh, to the Red Raiders. Shaker Heights improves to 3-1 and on the season, and, of course, they get their first victory in conference play. Brunswick drops to 0-4, and, um, and, of course, they are 0-1 in the conference. Now, you know what? you got to give credit to both defenses in this game. Uh, yeah. It was kind of a grounded, uh, grinded-out type game. Uh, Shakers D held Brunswick to 114 yards of total offense, while uh, Brunswick's defense held Shaker Heights to only 159 yards of total offense. Uh, for Brunswick, though, the only points that came were from two um, field goals from kicker Justin Hagler. Um, so good job from our very own Ed Dick on that one. Uh, two TDs for Shaker Heights. The defense got one of them, a fumble recovery in the end zone. And Shaker Heights running back Rasheen Ali had an 81-yard touchdown run. Um, he had 24 rushing attempts in this game for 95 yards. So he got, a, obviously, a big chunk of his yards on one play on his touchdown run. That's pretty much the name of the story on this one uh, as, once again, Brunswick falls to Shaker Heights 14-6. to yeah, and I mean, when you look at Brunswick's schedule, uh, you know, we talked about it a little bit. I mean, they had a 13 nothing loss to Cleveland Heights. Valley Forge, you lose by 13. You lose a game by 8. You know, they're they're not far. I mean, they're in the games. It's just, uh, you know, offensively putting up some points. It seems like it's been a little bit of a struggle this year um, for Brunswick trying to put up points. But like you say, give credit to both teams defensively. I mean, Brunswick's defense held Shaker Heights to 14 points. Um, it's just the offense is only able to to put up six. Yeah, I mean, I, I was the defense held the seven points. Uh, the other, I mean, the other touchdown was a uh, was a, was a defensive touchdown for Shaker Heights, and it was okay. a, it was an unfortunate mistake that uh, has plagued us the entire year. You know, whether we fumble going to score, uh, you know, driving to score, or fumble in our own in our own zone, and the other team takes advantage of it. Um, you know, obviously a very good game for for uh, for Justin Hagler. He uh, average about 41 yards a punt, you know, two field goals. Um, you know, unfortunately, as much as I love seeing three points being put on the board, we need to put seven points on the board much more often than what we than putting three points on the board. And um, unfortunately, there was a uh, you know there was a there was a uh, there was a, a situation that happened that went against us where um, the shaker punter punted it into his own personal protector. Uh, the ball rolls backwards. Our guy. Uh, uh, I, for lack of a better term, jumps on it, but never actually had control of the ball. And Shaker Heights recovered it. And I, I joke you not, both the the Brunswick offense and the Shaker defense goes out because that's, oh, okay, well, we blocked the punt. Shaker recovered it. Like, further down the field, we get the ball, you know, wherever we get the ball. The referees decided to sit – the referees in their infinite wisdom said the um, that we had possessed the ball and then fumbled the ball, which then – Switched the possession back over to Shaker Heights. Wow, yeah, it's a and that it's a. In order to be very PC about it, a questionable call at best, uh, but that is what the refs determined to say what happened. Uh, Shaker Heights ended up going three and out after that, and they punted. Um, 
Well, this is before all the scoring happened. Right. You know, at the very least, Brunswick gets the ball at the 10 yard line going to score. Um, figure you probably at least get a field goal attempt out of it, if not, if, if not more. And, you know, Brunswick could have had that. We could have had the first lead of the year on that, on that very one drive, on that, on that one drive. Um, it obviously didn't cost us the game and it win us. It would obviously didn't win us the game and didn't lose us the game. But those are the types of things that a team like that. We, we, when those things go against us, that just compounds, uh, some of the other issues that we have. So, uh, unfortunate thing that happened. It did, you know, uh, we were in it till the end, uh, which we have been for the last couple of weeks, and um, now we really we, we get into the meat grinder of the GCC, as uh, Josh will uh, further attest to. Uh, yes, that's true. We'll go over the schedule a little bit uh, later once we're done recapping uh, the Greater Cleveland Conference. Next game uh, for week four, and it was all Solon in this one as they defeat Elyria 44-21. Now, the sco- score is a little closer than the game actually um, – the score makes it seem like the, the game was closer, uh, but it was actually all Solon. It was 44 nothing at halftime, uh, and then Elyria did score its 21 points in the second half. Solon's defense in this game had two touchdowns. Uh, Solon running back uh, Khalil Eichelber- Eichelberger had two touchdowns, and um, Trevin Raphael had two touchdowns also for the comments. Uh, Jakeem Atkinson for Elyria had Two big touchdown runs, a 36-yarder and an 80-yard runner uh, once again in the second half. Uh, and then also the Elyria defense stepped up with a fumble recovery for a touchdown. Uh, but it was a little too little too late. Uh, Solon improves to 4-0. Elyria drops to 0-4. And as they will both continue GCC play next week. Uh, Euclid and Medina, this was kind of a big game, uh, especially for Medina after coming off of a, a, a not-so-good loss uh, to Wadsworth last week. Uh, Euclid was up 17-0 early uh, in this one. Uh, Euclid was scoring on all aspects on the offensive end. Running back Brandon Wright, the Michigan State recruit, 106 yards and a TD in this one. Quarterback Dion Valentine, 12 of 19, very efficient, 188 yards, two touchdowns. And wide receiver uh, and Toledo recruit Dray- uh, Drayvon Lindsay, four receptions for 51 yards and a touchdown. Uh, Medina did not help themselves in this game much. Um, they had four turnovers in the game. They gave Euclid some great starting field position. In fact, the average starting field position for the Panthers in this one was at the Medina 40-yard line. So when you have uh, a short field to try and score on, you're going to score. Good teams do score on those. Um, Medina quarterback Ryan Fisher in this game, not so good. 5 of 16, 144 yards, uh, and, a tu- uh, and one rushing touchdown in this one. Uh, as once again, Euclid drops Medina 37 into 14. Uh, Medina uh, drops to two and two. Uh, Euclid improves to three and one. The Minner Cardinals continue their winning ways as their offensive train keeps on rolling. Uh, they beat Strongsville 45 to 20 in this one, uh, and they were all led by. Uh, Running back and quarterback combo for the Cardinals. Running back Brian Trouble, 220 yards, two touchdowns. Now, in his first four games of this season, he has compiled 611 yards and 10 total touchdowns. Uh, Quarterback, sophomore quarterback Ian Kipp, uh, only 121 passing yards, but he still had three, three TDs to three different receivers. Nolan Vernon, Luke Floria, and Charlie Gallo all had touchdowns for the Cardinals. Uh, for Strongsville, running back Taylor Griffin was held to only 21 yards in the first half as he's having a real good year. Uh, he did score on a long TD run in the second half. Also, Johnny Major scored a touchdown in the second half. But uh, for the Mustangs, it was not enough as Menor improves to 4-0 in the GCC. Strong- Strongsville drops to 3-1. and uh, And like all, like I said, all eight of these teams continue to play against one another in Week 5. Menor will travel to Brunswick, Solon. We'll travel to Strongsville, Euclid travels to Elyria, and to round it out, Shaker Heights uh, will travel to Medina. My player of the week in the uh, GCC, Mentor running back Brian Trouble, 220 yards, two touchdowns, uh, a workmanlike effort for his team as they continue to roll in the Greater Cleveland Conference. It's very impressive. I mean, Mentor just continues. I wondered if Strongsville would give them a battle there. Um, they're having a pretty good season. Um, they put up a little bit of a fight, but you know, Menor's that team, their depth, and they just, they're just a really good all around team. And, and when you add the depth they have, I mean, it, they're, they're tough to beat as St. Ed's 
and some of those teams have, have seen. Yeah, I think you know you, you look at you kind of look down the schedule, and if things hold the way they've been holding over the last week, over the last couple of weeks, that Soul and Mentor game is going to be a great, great matchup in the GCC, and probably will end up deciding the GCC for for Very the well most could. part. Um, still got still got players like you know teams like Euclid out there that could make a make a make a noise. Now I I know we mentioned uh, last week or the week before that we could be possibly uh, mentioning and and kind of referencing our good friend Joe Itell. Well, I'm gonna ha- go ahead and do that this week for the GCC because um, according to Joe Itell, uh, after week four, um, the top three schools in Division One Region One are all GCC teams with Menor. Uh, number one, Solon number two, Euclid number three. Now there's a couple other teams that if the playoffs were to start today that would be in the playoffs, and that would be Strongsville. They are at number six. Medina uh, is at number seven. Shaker Heights, real close. They're sitting at number 10. Uh, and then O'Leary and Brunswick will round out. Uh, we'll round that out for the GCC uh, uh, playoffs but uh, I just thought I'd like to mention that the top three teams, Division One, Region One, are from the Greater Cleveland Conference. Now, is it crazy right now that St. Ignatius is actually 13th and Berea Mid Park is actually ahead of them? Uh, uh, more along I mean, with John Marshall. Well, uh, I mean, Ignatius. Uh, it's early. It, it is. I mean, and you, if you, you you obviously don't get points for losing games, uh, but their two losses are to Archbishop Hoban and Mentor. Yeah. And, um, both of those teams are 4-0 and are looking very, very good for locking up a playoff spot probably within the next three weeks. Not, No joking there. Um, you know, St. Ignatius takes care of business the rest of the year. I, they'll, they'll have they'll no problem getting at least getting in. And then, you know, I, you'd be hard-pressed to not find Mentor playing either Ignatius or St. Ed again at some point in time during the playoffs. They may have to see him twice again or see the, each of them again, which will make three times in a calendar year that <laughs> Metro will have to play oh, St. Ed's and St. Ignatius. And I have to think it would be unheard of for one team to have defeated those two teams three times in one calendar year. But I think it, we can all agree that if a team's going to do that, it's the Mentor Cardinals this year's version oh, of the Mentor Cardinals yeah. and the way they're playing right now. Yeah, and but I, I still, again, I that Solon game, you know, is that Solon, that Solon team has – you know, road rough shot over every team they've played so far. So I Defe- wouldn't. Their defense is stacked. Menor's good, but you know, hey, let's not count out Solon. I mean, you got yourself a, a you know, kind of a showdown at the OK Corral in, in the GCC there, Josh. We got three. I mean, the three, the three Eastern schools between Menor, U- Solon, and Euclid. I mean, those have been, you know, traditionally those have been the three best schools since this conference has has, has come up. And Medina has had a had a couple of very good years. Um, with Jimmy Daw and some of the other te- some of the other teams they've been able to put together, but you know, as far as cracking the the Eastern Code, it, it's been Menor, Solon, and Euclid that you know have interchangeably been the top three teams uh, in that in, in the new iteration of the GCC. Yeah, and we'll wait and see uh, how strong Zone the rest of the teams do if they can somehow keep winning to make it into the playoffs. So we'll wait and see on that. Now let's go to the Southwestern Conference for Week Four, and we'll start off is Avon Lake traveled to Westlake. And Avon Lake looking to stay undefeated. And Westlake, they're just looking to win a game here against a very good Shoreman team. But uh, Avon Lake, they dominated the line of scrimmage once again. And that's their strength this year is running back Connor Riggs and uh, quarterback Jack McCulloch uh, led the Shoreman. Avon Lake, they would score first with uh, quarterback Jack McCulloch throwing a touchdown to Cole Schraff. Uh, Westlake, though, they would respond with a Jacob May three-yard touchdown. That tied the game, but that was the last time that that game game would be tied (laughs) as Avon Lake would rattle off 35 straight points as Connor Riggs would uh, rush for 163 yards on 12 carries. He had two touchdowns. Quarterback Jack McCulloch had 195 yards, um, three of them passing, one rushing, um, and for Westlake, it was J.J. Coleman. He rushed for 128 yards. Avon Lake gets a big win and wins 42-7. to um, They improved to 4-0, 3-0 in conference, and will host Lakewood. Westlake, they fall to 0-4 and will host North Olmstead. Uh, Midview, they travel to Amherst. And Amherst, another team that's been dominating so far this season, and uh, they had the same record last season headed 
um, as they went into midview last season. This time the outcome would be a little bit different as Kennedy Scagliazzo had 162 yards rushing and six touchdowns in this game that would actually start off with midview scoring first on Edwin Relat from Andrew Gooch. Uh, midview is up 7 to nothing, but Amherst would go on a 42 to nothing run in this game. Amherst, they stay undefeated with a 55 to 13 win over the Midview Middies. Amherst, they improved to 4 and 0, 3 and 0 in conference and will host Berea Mid Park, which is going to be an absolute outstanding game. That's going to be a big one for both teams. And big mid- one and possibly a shootout. I, and that's the way it's been going. Amherst, um, you know, you can say you want to stop Kennedy Scagliazzo, but a lot of teams haven't been able to do it this year. Will Berea Mid Park's defense be able to contain uh, Skaglazzo? We'll wait and see. Midview, they fall to 0-4, and, and it doesn't get easier for them as they will host the Avon Eagles. So, again, Midview, um, you know, for the first time in a long time, it's 0-4 and four on the year. Shocking. Shocking. If it is. If you're a Midview fan, you did not expect 0-4, uh, you know, to start the season. And, and I mean, we're deep in a conference play for the Southwestern Conference. I think they're just trying to look to get some wins this year. Well, and a lot um, of – some of them were close. I mean, North Ridgeville was, a you know, a, a one-point, I think, yeah. game. They went into overtime with North Olmstead. So, unfortunate games for them, but uh, still at 0-4 and four this year. Um, Do they have a shot, outside shot, to make the playoffs? I mean, yeah, they'd, have to, they'd have to rattle uh, off six straight wins. They'd but probably even have to win out. Is that, would, uh, yeah, I'm saying it. just to be realistically in. Yeah, I mean, they, you have – right now you have four teams on their schedule still that are three or three and one in, or better. Okay. And, um, you know, so you obviously have to rip those out. Uh, we'll talk more about Lakewood a little bit later, but yeah. Westlake right now is winless. So yeah. I mean, yeah. you, pretty much all you'll get from them is the level one points from being a Division yeah. two team, right? Okay. So they're yeah they're gonna so have to. It's gonna <laughs> it's gonna be tough to say the least. We'll see if Joe Itell had once he gives the uh, the statuses at what point would they be uh, mathematically eliminated. mathematically eliminated? Yeah. It's always interesting to go to Joe Itell. Go to joeitell.com and, and look up all that info on uh, where you stand right now. It's early, but it's still very interesting with the points. Um, Olmstead Falls, they traveled to Lakewood. And Olmstead Falls, let's just put it this way, they were firing on all cylinders, jumping out to a 42 to nothing lead at halftime. Um, it was Jack Spelsey and Michael Howard. They combined for five touchdowns um, in this game. Lakewood, they would score when uh, – Ranger senior Kyron Jefferson took a bubble screen, and Albert Wilhelmy, the quarterback, they ran 46 yards for Lakewood's first touchdown. They would score once more as the quarterback, Albert Wilhelmy, uh, would hit wide receiver Evan Hampton for a score, but it wasn't enough as Olmstead Falls wins big, 49-14 to in the game. Olmstead Falls now improves to 3-1. and one. They're 2-1 in conference with that Avon loss. And they will travel to North Ridgeville next. Um, as Lakewood, they fall to 0-4, and four, and they will hit the road as they face another tough conference game against undefeated Avon Lake. Uh, North Ridgeville, they went and traveled to Berea Mid Park, which Berea Mid Park at home is always tough. And uh, Berea Mid Park would start by running the ball as running back Jabril Williams had three first-quarter touchdowns in this game. It was 23 to nothing. After the first quarter, which was a surprise, but the Rangers, they wouldn't give up. But Berea Midpark running back Bryce Agnew scored to start uh, the second quarter. It was 29 to nothing in the third quarter before North Ridgeville would try a comeback, going on a 20 to nothing run in the third quarter. It was Cade Riley and Cale Bright with touchdown runs. Matt Steinmetz uh, would connect with wide receiver Jeremy Sanchez. Uh, Berea Midpark, they did have four interceptions, three by Chase Ivancic, um, as he had a heck of a day on the defensive side of the ball. Berea Midpark, they stopped the Rangers' comeback by holding on to win 52-27. to It was quarterback Trevor Bazinski. He threw for 318 and three touchdowns, and they got seven different wide receivers with receptions in the game. Garrett Waite hauled in eight receptions for 91 yards and a touchdown. Berea Midpark improves to 3-1, and 3-0 and in the Southwestern Conference, and they will have a very important game as they travel to Amherst. Two undefeated teams in conference, 
as North Ridgeville look to get back on track and find their winning ways as they will host Olmstead Falls. So Berea Mid Park again uh, with a big time win, 52 to 27. Uh, North Olmstead they traveled to Avon, and Avon would jump out early in this one. It was 28 to seven. They would lead in the first half uh, against. Uh, the North Olmstead Eagles, which would set the tone in the game as Avon and North Olmstead. They were tied at seven early on in the first quarter, but then North Olmstead, they would drive the ball down t- into Avon territory within the 25-yard line four times in this game, but came away with no points each of those four times. Avon running back Mike Steinmetz ran for 121 yards on eight carries and had two touchdowns and an interception actually on defense as Avon quarterback Ryan Malloy threw for three touchdowns. Uh, For North Olmstead, it was uh, Darren Anders again with a touchdown run and 89 yards rushing. Avon wins big in this one, 49-21, as they now improve to 3-1, 2-1 in conference, and will travel to Midview as North Olmstead falls to 2-2, 1-2 in conference, and they will travel to Westlake. My player of the week you know, in back-to-back weeks, it's hard not to pick this guy. Kendi Scagliazzo had six touchdowns and 162 yards. Um, and the week before, he had 31 rushes for 285 yards and four touchdowns. Now on the season through four games, he has 811 yards rushing on the season. So Kennedy Scagliazzo of Amherst is my player of the week in the Southwestern Conference. So there's the uh, SWC, and if you want to go over into Joe Itell, <coughs> Avon Lakes actually uh, ranked number three, and this is uh, Division Two Region Six, with Anthony uh, Wayne uh, Whitehouse would be number one. They're four and zero, oh, and Central Toledo Central Catholic um, is number two, and then Avon Lake at three, Avon at four, Amherst at five, and then Valley Forge at number six. Um, Holland Springfield at number seven, and then number eight would be Toledo, St. Francis de Sales. The next team is uh, North Olmsted at 11, and Olmsted Falls at number 12. So, you know, still a lot of game left, but uh, how about Valley Forge at number six right now? Yeah, Coach uh, Marcel DeAngelis had a big, uh, got a big win over an in, uh, in city rival in uh, Normandy, a 48 to 14 victory there. And, uh, you know, they have a lot of a real good opportunity for points against Elyria Catholic in a conference game and then uh, a very, very good uh, Garfield Heights team coming up in week six and then before they resume uh, conference play. Um, so for uh, for Valley Forge, um, I, I think the big thing with the – the big thing with the Southwestern Conference right now is that there isn't uh, – in years past, there's been a lot more balance with those te- with the teams – uh, right now, unfortunately, Lakewood and Westlake are both uh, – they're both not doing as well. Yeah, they're a little bit they, down right now. They're a little bit down, and Midview, is a, as we've talked about before, is a big surprise yeah. uh, at 0-4. So right now you have three 0-4 teams and then a 1-3 team in North Ridgeville. Then you have a 2-2 two and two team, North Olmstead, and then everybody else is 3-1 and one or 4-0. and oh. So some of the teams that we're used to seeing up in the upper echelon of the of Division Two, Region Six, and I'll I'll throw Bury and Mid Park in Division One, Region One. They're suffering a little bit right now because they these are the teams that have defeated the West Lakes, the Lakewoods, the Midviews, and they're not getting those second level points that will get into much more as the season goes on. But um, you know, right now we, there's a clear divide between the top of the conference. You have a little bit of a middle conference there. North Olmstead has the potential to get up into that upper echelon. And then right now, North Ridgeville, Westlake, Lakewood, and Midview are, are struggling to stay afloat uh, in the bottom of the conference. Still have to be impressed with Avon Lake as they continue uh, their great season that they've had so far, 42-7 victory over Westlake. And, I mean, you would just assume we just talked about, you know, the bottom half of the conference. You know, they go ahead and play Lakewood, and then they play North Ridgeville. So they have – uh, you know, two their next two games are very winnable. Uh, before it looks like a, you know, what could a be a tough stretch. huge showdown between Amherst um, and them in in a few weeks. But Amherst, to be looking at their schedule, they have some tough games coming up now. Bria Mid Park and Olmstead Falls, so those are big games yeah. for them. So you're getting into the the really important and 
uh, really interesting part of the Southwestern Conference schedule, and it's going to be fun to see how it plays out over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I think we'll start to see teams uh, separate themselves a little bit, uh, you know, probably in the top three or four um, in the conference. But uh, we'll step away. We'll take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about the Suburban League. Ed and uh, Sean will cover that. We also have our game of the week that was sponsored by MGD Flooring. Buckeye against Luther and West. We'll go over that game and tell you a little bit about our game uh, coming up, which is our game of the week this Friday, um, which is sponsored by Westlake Interior Painting. So we'll tell you all about that when we come back. Um, and I know Sean and Ed are itching at the bit to cover the Suburban League. Sean's actually starting to shake a little bit. He's getting so excited. But we have to take a break and give it a credit you know, to some of our uh, lovely people. We'll be back after this. We're Sports on Tap. Go on Twitter at SOT Podcast. Go to our website. We'll be right back with more Week 4 Game Recap. Are you a business? Want to be featured on Sports on Tap? Get in front of different age groups in the local community. Contact us at Sports on Tap Podcast at gmail.com for more information. RRT Productions, specializing in creating sports recruiting videos for all high school athletes. Want to play at the next level? Promote your talents with a video to send colleges. Affordable, experienced, and a high-quality video. Make us your local video production company. Visit our website, rrt-productions.com, and contact us today. RRT Productions, we shoot, we edit, you win of the season it's always the right time for z's cream of bean whether you want to warm up with some of their delicious soups chilies or coffees or sample from their delicious selection of ice cream shakes and other cool treats z's cream of bean has you covered visit them at 2706 boston road in hinkley ohio and tell them the guys at sports on tap sent you coverage of Cavs, Indians, and Browns, check out NEOSportsInsiders.com. NEOSportsInsiders.com brings you breaking news, opinions, and video from all things related to your favorite Cleveland sports teams. Like us on Facebook and follow at NEOSportsInsiders on Twitter for live updates from all the games. NEOSportsInsiders.com, bringing you the best in Northeast Ohio sports coverage.
listen to our shows live on Mixer or join us the first Monday of every month at Z's Cream and Bean, located at 2706 Boston Road in Hinkley. Want to listen to past shows? Go to our YouTube page or website, www.sportsontappodcast.com. SportsOnTapPodcast.com, the place to go where you can listen to past shows, read featured articles, check out all of our social media updates, plus much, much more. SportsOnTapPodcast.com, the official website of Sports on Tap. local high school sports action including photos videos and live updates be sure to follow sports on tap on twitter instagram and like us on facebook Welcome back to Sports on Tap. It's our week four game recaps here on Sports on Tap, live on Mixler. You can catch all of uh, these shows on our YouTube page where we archive all of these shows. Go to uh, our Twitter page as well, at SOT Podcast, if you want to see some of our uh, postings on our website at sportsontappodcast.com. Um, we also give in-game uh, statistics, video, Sean writes a great story on our website. Most of the time. Usually. Yeah. I mean. But a lot, a lot there. More hits than misses, I guess you would describe, <laughs> you would describe my writing ability. But um, so a lot of the good things there. We're also on Facebook and uh, Instagram as well. So now let's go over to uh, the Suburban League, the National Division, where Ed is going to give us our week four game recaps. All right, week four kicked off the start of conference play for the Suburban League in both the National and American Divisions, at least for most of the American Division, as Sean will get to later. Uh, the first matchup did see two unbeatens, Macedonia and Nordonia, traveling to Art Wright Stadium to battle the defending Suburban League National Division champion, Wadsworth. The Knights had already surpassed last year's win total, and were looking to make a statement against the Grizzlies. Nordonia delivered early as running back Niles Beverly recovered a fumble in the end zone for a touchdown and a 7-0 lead. Watch with quarterback Trey Schaefer countered with two touchdown passes covering 9 and 27 yards to wide receiver Carson Risher and running back Brock Snowball, respectively. The Knights then tied it up on a 48-yard touchdown pass from quarterback Robbie Levac to wide receiver <laughs> Jordan Jones for a 14-14 tie into the halftime. Wadsworth did win the third quarter as uh, Carson Risher scored on a 33-yard run. This was countered then by a 47-yard field goal by Nordonia kicker even, uh, Evan uh, Weehy. The, the Grizzlies then pulled away in the, in the fourth on touchdown runs by Brock Snowball and Dom Laparo. The Grizzlies come away with a very hard-fought 35-25 to win over Nordonia. Ooh. Watch wow. with the quarterback. Yeah, this was a uh, pretty close game. Abs yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, watch with quarterback Trey Schaefer. 
He completed 12 of 16 passing for 105 yards and two touchdowns. He also ran for another 77 yards. Brock Snowball, Dom Laparo, and Carson Risher each tallied over 100 yards from scrimmage to lead the Grizzlies. Nordonia quarterback Robbie Levac threw for 185 yards and a touchdown. He also had punts of 58 and 62 yards, uh, each of which were down inside the five-yard line. And wide receiver Jordan Jones caught nine passes for 127 yards and a touchdown to lead the Knights. With the win, Wadsworth improves to 4-0 overall, 1-0 in the conference. Next week, they will travel to Stowe Monroe Falls. Nordonia, they suffered their first loss of the season. They are now 3-1 overall, 0-1 in the conference. They will host Hudson in week five. Uh, this was a very, really good uh, measuring stick for Nordonia to see where, yeah. just how far they have come since last year. They do have a very veteran team. Robbie Levac is a three-year starter as a quarterback. And uh, uh, you know, in, 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 if, you t- if you talk to Wadsworth, it, they were very, very respectful of the Nordonia, of Nordonia, and, and quite honestly, you know, it, it was summed up by Coach Todd uh, from uh, Wadsworth. They're saying they, this team is sick of losing, and they they showed it tonight. Uh, obviously, Wadsworth was on the winning end of that, but um, that said, a very, very good game by Nordonia um, going yeah. into uh, their battle next week against Hudson. I was going to say, that's an impressive, uh, you know, Nordonia's had some down years, but I think they're going to be really good this year, especially, like you said, that's a measuring stick because Wadsworth is just dominating teams this year. So let's. I'm interested to see how Nordonia is going to bounce back after a loss like that. Yeah, and absolutely. And there'll be an overarching theme here that we'll discuss uh, with the American, with the, I'm sorry, the, the National Division here uh, after, after we get through this, uh, the next couple of games here. Uh, another which takes place. Uh, another intriguing battle took place at Serpentini Chevrolet Stadium on the corner of Ridge and Worldton Road as 2-1 and one North Worldton hosted winless but dangerous Stowe Monroe Falls. The Bulldogs jumped out to a 17-10 halftime lead and extended the lead to 24-10 before the Bears tied it at 24 going into the fourth quarter. The teams traded scores until Stowe quarterback Josh Andrezzi ran for a short touchdown with under a minute left to break a 31-all tie and the collective hearts of Bears fans for the second straight week. Stowe Monroe Falls defeats North Worldton 38-31. Stowe quarterback Josh Andrezzi ran for two scores, and running back J.R. Atkinson rushed for another to lead the Bulldogs. North Worldton quarterback Joey Marisek completed 15-35 passing for 272 yards, four touchdowns, and had one interception. Wow. Bradley Kometz. Three passes. Uh, he caught three passes for 122 yards and two touchdowns. And wide receiver Riley Nurick caught seven passes for 72 yards and a touchdown to lead the Bears. Stowe Monroe Falls gets their first win in 2018. They will host undefeated Wadsworth in Week Five. North Royalton falls to two and two, 0 and one the conference. They will look back. They will look to bounce back from consecutive last-minute losses when they host Twinsburg. Speaking of Twinsburg, they look to even the record at 2-2 two and two against winless Cuyahoga Falls. After a scoreless first quarter, the Tigers got on the board with rushing touchdowns from running back Maravon Johnson from 15 yards out and quarterback Max Brazzi from 7 yards out in a 14-0 halftime lead. Brazzi then found wide receiver Jameel Banks for a 22-yard touchdown to extend the lead to 21-0. Cuyahoga Falls countered with a five-yard touchdown pass from Bronavon Aronsalt to Deshaun Brazil, the first of two touchdowns uh, between the two players. But it was not enough. What is Twinsburg gets a second touchdown pass from Brezzi to Banks and a 52-yard pick six from Darren Ritter and a 35-12 Twinsburg win over Cuyahoga Falls. Twinsburg quarterback Max Brazzi filling in for Adam Van de Motter, completed 8 of 18 passing for 96 yards and two touchdowns, both of which went to Jameel Banks. He had four catches for 67 yards. Twinsburg improves to 2 and 2 overall, 1 and 0 in the conference. They will travel to 2 and 2 North Royalton. Kyle Falls is 0 and 4 overall, 0 and 1 in the conference. They will host Brexville Broadview Heights in week 5. Lastly, Two winless teams in Hudson and host Brexville Broadview Heights battled for their first 2018 win. After a slow start in the first quarter for both teams, 
Hudson quarterback Liam Brennan paired with running back Drew Leitner for a seven-yard touchdown pass and a 7 nothing halftime lead. The Hudson defense turned back the clock uh, from past years, and they hounded B's quarterback Joe Labas and their collective offense all night long. Brennan then uh, quarterback Luke uh, Liam Brennan found Luke McLaughlin and Peyton Miller for scores of 16 and 18 yards. The Explorers run away with a 27 nothing victory over the Brexville Broadview Heights Bees. <laughs> Hudson quarterback Liam Brennan completed 19 of 29 passing for 248 yards and a touchdown. Uh, running back Drew Leitner rushed 21 times for 107 yards and caught one pass for a seven yard touchdown. Luke McLaughlin seven, uh, caught seven passes for 92 yards and a score. Hudson held Brexville Broadview Heights to just 93 yards of total offense. Mm. That's the type of defense that we are used to seeing from Hudson. The Explorers improved to 1-3 and three overall, 1-0 and oh in the conference. They will travel to Macedonia to play the 3-1 and one Nordonian Knights. Brexville Broadview Heights remains winless. They will look for their first win against visiting and winless Cuyahoga Falls. You know, does that surprise you a little bit? Uh, you know, looking at Brexville Broadview Heights, I mean, they scored 28 points in game one, and since then, I mean, only seven points, you know, six points, and then zero. It seems like offensively, you know, maybe their confidence is a little bit down. I mean, after that first game, they looked impressive. I thought Joe Labis was an impressive uh, quarterback, and it just seems like it's not connecting for him right now. I think these are just growing pains that that young offense is going through. These, uh, they have been a very senior laden, senior uh, laden team uh, for the last couple of years. It started when we first started covering these guys. With Luke Sternod uh, was the was the starting quarterback, and he was pretty much another coach on the field. Um, and then he had junior, he had very very good juniors. He was throwing to at the time, uh, Sam Wigloos, um, who took over as a senior, had a tremendous year last year to help out the freshman Labas. Right now, I don't think they have as many offensive weapons around Joe Labas as he had last year, which, you know, unfortunately, Labas at this point isn't to the level where he can elevate his game to bring his teammates around him. Definitely not saying he can't get there. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I think I think what we're seeing with North Royalton, which we'll talk about here in a minute, is, is, is what we may see with uh, Labas next year. Labas is only a sophomore. Um, yeah. This is this you know this is the sophomore you know call it a sophomore slump, but this could be the year you know where he, he has to take some hits. He's got to take some lumps, and that offense just needs to kind of grow up around him. And um, you know it's they have they have a vulnerable game next week against Cuyahoga Falls. We'll see if that offense can get on track and uh, get put some points on the board uh, against the Black Tigers. I think the theme of this week is, um, you know, you look at the standings in the Suburban League National Division, and you saw Hudson and Stowe Bunro Falls both at 0-3. And, and then you saw teams like, uh, you know, you saw Nordonia at 1-3-0, and at three and Wadsworth, the defending champions, 3-0, and North World's hit at 2-1. and one. And they have a big game against Twinsburg. I think that's an important game because I think now North Royalton has lost back-to-back -back weeks. Yes. Um, you know, how are they going to recover or, you know, is it going to continue to go downhill? Um, I think if they can get a, a good win at Twinsburg, maybe this season, you know, still obviously it's early so it can be saved, but they need they need to stop the losing streak here a little bit. Well, and th this, that's a great point, Rob. When you talk about North Worldson, and they're, they're playing one of the best teams – so far in the national division in Stone Monroe Falls. Stone Monroe Falls has a tradition. You know, they won the conference two years ago. They've had very, very good success in the last couple of years, and North Royalton has just has not. Yeah. You know, so you had an up and coming team in North Royalton who had Highland as about as dead direction as you possibly have them before you before a great player was able to you know was able to defeat them. It took the same effort for Stone Monroe Falls. At the end of the day, Stone Monroe Falls is still a really good team. Mm -hmm. um, between Hudson and, and Stone Monroe Falls, the teams that they've played in their non-conference have been very, very good teams. Yeah. And these are games that we are used to seeing those teams winning, those first three games, at least one of them, if not more. You know, So while their record doesn't look like they are of good caliber, make no mistake, Stone Monroe Falls and Hudson can just as easily win this conference as Wadsworth and Nordonia can uh, who have right now at this point gaudier records than that of Hudson and, and, and Stone Monroe Falls um, with Nordonia 
and uh, this will be the last thing I mentioned before I talk to uh, before we shoot it over. You know, Nordonia is on the precipice right now. Uh, this is their window. They have a very very good quarterback in Robbie Levac. Um, I d I'm not exactly sure who's who's behind him and 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 if they're going to be able to sustain this success. But this is the type of game. These are the type of games that they need to be able to win this year. Um, Wadsworth, believe me, you can't just roll out the ball and say, we're going to be a Wadsworth because we said we're going to be a Wadsworth. This is not going to happen. Yeah. Um, they, they gave them all they can handle. Now they go to, they go to Hudson or they host Hudson right now. One and three, once again, a team that doesn't have a gaudy record, but can just as easily win the conference at seven and three and make the playoffs. This is the type of game that w another measuring stick for Nordonia. Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, I think uh, North Royalton went through this. They played a really good Highland team, but they fell, and I'm sure that one hurt because it was yep. so close. Now they've lost two in a row. Can they bounce back? Nordonia loses a tough one to Wadsworth. Can they bounce back from yep. this? It's gonna be it's gonna be an interesting uh, week five coming up. You know, we're we're to see if the old guard in Hudson Stowe and obviously Wadsworth can continue at the, at the top of the conference standings, and then. You know, can North Wilton and, and and Nordonia break that? Can yep, they can they exactly. defeat those teams and break that upper echelon and then make a playoff run? Yep. That's that's what we're gonna look for here as the season rolls on. My player of the week is Hudson quarterback Liam Brennan. He had nineteen of twenty nine passing for two hundred and forty eight yards and three touchdowns. We now will bring it over to my cohort, my compadre, <laughs> my colleague, Sean Duffy to Talk about the Suburban League American Division. Just Thank one you. thing. It's Just one. one thing. Just one thing. Just one thing before we go, guys. <laughs> Going to give you a quick synopsis <laughs> of how Week 4 shook out for the American Conference. Aurora played host to Talmadge and were able to withstand a first-quarter onslaught by the visiting Blue Devils to secure a 32-18 to conference victory. Talmadge would score all 18 of their first all 18 of their points in the first quarter after Aurora started the scoring off taking the opening kickoff 84 yards returned by Graham Aldridge for for a touchdown. Quarterback Sam Seeker scored on a 40-yard touchdown run and would connect with one of his wide receivers for a 20-yard touchdown pass. Talmadge's running back Yamakoski would end up scoring a 1-yard touchdown run. Important thing to note here, all extra points, all kicks and the two-point conversion on all these scoring drives were missed, failed, didn't work. Wow. Aurora started. Aurora's Colin McNamara ended up finishing with 19 rushing attempts and 152 yards and two rushing touchdowns to lead the Green Men to victory. Talmadge falls to two and two overall and 0 and one in the conference. They travel out of conference to play Dover for a non-conference matchup in Week Five. Aurora improves to three and one overall, one and 0 in the conference. They travel to take on Roosevelt in Week Five. My in the one of in perhaps the most intriguing conference matchup of the week, Barberton was able to take advantage of some really costly Revere Minutemen turnovers and snatch a 32-20 victory from the Minutemen. Barberton found themselves in an early 10-0 hole, but rebounded thanks in part to a great offensive performances. Quarterback, I'm sorry, Magic's quarterback Chase Haywood ended up eight of thirteen with 141 yards and three passing touchdowns. Wide receiver Derek Vaughn had two two of those touchdown receptions. Running back Kyrie Young had 26 carries, 190 yards, and a touchdown. But the Magic's defense was able to force three interceptions and a fumble on the night, converting all of those to points. Timothy Starcher had an interception return for, for a 55-yard touchdown as well and as the Magic's defense completely took advantage of some really bad miscues on the part of Revere, something that we did, have not seen through the first three weeks of the season. Revere was led on offense by quarterback Nathan Klonowski, who went 13-29 for 169 yards and one touchdown. Running back Brandon Tracano had 17 carries and 125 yards on the ground and one touchdown. Wide receiver Matt Busser had five receptions for 100 yards but could not cross into the end zone as the Barber as the Revere Minutemen fall to 3 and 1 overall and 0 and 1 in the conference they will travel to take on Highland in week 5. Barberton is 4 and 0 overall, 1 and 0 in conference play. They host Copley in week 5. In the lone non-conference matchup this week, Copley defeated Bedford 23-6 at home, and it was all Copley all night. Copley's quarterback, Riho, led the way passing when he went 14 of 26 for 111 yards and two touchdowns, spraggling for the, for the Indians. 
uh, I'm sorry, running back Spragling from the Indians scored on a four-yard touchdown run. Copley improves to two and two overall, two and two overall, and they will open their conference schedule as they they travel to take on Barberton in Week Five, and in the game that was a shootout in the sense that, you know. A lot of points were scored and a lot of highlights. And if you guys can all attest, I have an entire page of highlights for this game. Highland used a smothering defense and a and what I call the human cheat code in a route of the visiting Rough Riders, 63-23. to This game was over at halftime. It was 56-14 to at half. And then at the, after the human cheat code, Jake Rogers, who scored five total touchdowns on the night, he actually touched the ball 14 times and gained 246 yards and four rushing touchdowns. Adding to that, he had a 48-yard punt, punt return for a TD. The most amazing thing happened here, guys, all of this was done in just a little over one half of football. That means he played one series into the second half, and he was done, and he still put up these gaudy, gaudy numbers. He's uh, he's definitely what I call the human cheat code. Now, not to be outdone, Hornets' Charlie Myers also had a 55-yard punt return for a touchdown. Wide receiver Bryce Prophet hauled in two touchdowns and 100 yards on the night. And quarterback Jack McGinty, who did not have to toss the ball at all at this point because they were just handing it off to Jake Rogers, uh, did end up having those two passing touchdowns on the night. Highland scored touchdowns on all six of its offensive possessions in the first half. Highland's defense provided the offense with great field position all night thanks to eight sacks in the first half and two forced fumbles. Senior Jack Coleman had two and a half sacks on the night. Senior Joey Hammond Johnson had three and a half sacks on the night. Roosevelt was under fire all night, but when, when he was able to, C.J. Anderson did go 9-23 of for 166 yards, one passing touchdown and a running touchdown. And Christian Dentweiler had a six-yard touchdown run for the Rough Riders. Roosevelt falls to two and two and zero and one in the conference. They will host Aurora in Week Five. Highland three and one overall, one and zero in the conference. They will host Revere in Week Five. Guys, my Player of the Week. I've tried to avoid it for three weeks. I can't do it anymore. The Human Cheat Code: Jake Rogers, fourteen total touches, two hundred forty-six yards, four rushing touchdowns, and a forty-eight yard punt return for a touchdown. I believe that's his third. This guy's just a playmaker. Yeah. I mean, I mean without him, Highland's offense, I, I mean, I don't know. Well, I'm sure they would find other ways to score, but, I mean, he just makes so many plays. It's unbelievable. Wh- I mean, wh- whether it's a kick return, punt return, he's in the backfield, you know, running the ball for 246 yards. He, I mean, this guy's unbelievable. He's in the passing game. I mean, listen, to take nothing away from the from – the, from the accomplishments of quarterback Jack McGinty, who really is a gutsy performer. We saw that, Josh, at, at when they played uh, North Royalton two weeks ago. You know, the kid is in there battling, but you know what? It helps when you can hand it off to a guy like Rodgers, who every time he gets the ball has the opportunity to take it to the house. And every time he – I mean, teams are actively not punting to him, and when the off chance he does get the ball on a punt, he just seems to be able to find that little crease, and he's gone. Well, the good thing about McGinty, too, is when he – Needs to play, uh, make a play. He has the ability to yeah, do it. So absolutely. that's uh, definitely a luxury to have. So they're not leaning 100% on Jake Rogers. Uh, McKinty can make some plays, but um, but like like you guys said, if you got a running back like that that can just is just a flat out playmaker, feed him the rock. I, I say the best game, as I mentioned in my recap, was the Barberton Revere game. This was a close game throughout, but you know those costly mistakes by Revere. They, they all turned into points, and they all went the wrong way, for, for or at least went the right way for Barberton. Um, you know, Barberton's for real, guys. I think they are the team to beat. And, you know, they have a couple of – they have a good game next week against Copley. Um, Copley, you know, Copley's kind of a – you never know what you're going to get with that team. Uh, but they but they come to play. Uh you know, they have to they have they host them at home, which is a benefit. But I'm really looking forward to that Barberton Aurora game. It, it seems like for the past few years that game is pretty much dictated whoever wins the, the American division. Now adding to that, I think Highland is really starting to find something on offense. I mean, for, for the first two weeks they couldn't seem to get into the end zone. They had penalties. And then these last two weeks has been an offensive just explosion. A lot of it Jake Rogers, but Bryce Prophet has scored a couple touchdowns in the passing game. You know, you have others contributing, which is helping. Their offensive line, I think, is finally using that experience to, to kind of form a, a cohesive unit. So I wouldn't be surprised if Highland, you know, was a dangerous team that no one wants to play come towards the end of the year. And, you know, both those teams, I think all three of these teams 
Barberton, Aurora, and Highland, um, and to a certain extent, Revere, too. I, I wouldn't count Revere out either for all making playoffs. It's very interesting to see how these teams play out. Now, again, they're readily pretty much in the same division, with the exception, I believe, of Highland. Um, and, you know, we'll see how that shakes out. But, yeah, definitely a, a great week in the American division. Uh, you know, one of the things that I like about this division is no team has – zero losses every team has had some some semblance of victory so the parity in this division is maybe a little bit better than i would say the national division where you have a couple teams that are looking for their first wins of the season you know there's some there's some competition here which is great um so definitely look forward to seeing what, what happens next week you know, i want to see um you know we'll, we'll, you know, the conference is kind of a little bit in flux right now you know, it's there for the taking. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have dominant the dominance that Barberton had last year. You yeah. have very good players. Yeah. But you don't have Zane Reese anymore or uh, uh, Key Thompson, I believe. Yeah. Uh, no, there to just run rough shot over the conference. You you as you so eloquently described, you do have the human cheat code. That's and what Jake he Rogers is. for 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 uh, for Highland. Is that going to be enough to sustain over the, over the course of the conference? Revere yeah. has a offense that's been building up to this point to be able to explode this year, and that's exactly what they've done, save for shooting themselves in the foot yeah. a little bit against Barberton. Yeah. If they can clean those mistakes up, you know, it's it's not out of the realm of possibility that Revere um, can find themselves in, in not only the conference top but the playoff hunt a little bit later uh, in the season. And uh, and Aurora is Aurora. They, they, they yeah, it seems like team. they always – I mean, even last year, you know, they were a 500 team, and they, I think they did make the playoffs, they make right? The playoffs, they just right? made the playoffs. This year, I mean, but they they're had just always very uh, fundamentally sound team. Um, you know, they don't beat themselves too many times, and uh, I thought they got a big win this week. They did. I mean, beating a team uh, like Talmadge. Talmadge is no slouch either. They've they've been playing pretty well. You know, quarterback Sam Seeker out of Talmadge is a really good player. Um, he's been on there for a couple of years. He's been doing a good job. I think the you know the the couple of things that I want to say uh, is you know Aurora is. Three and one, and they're one and zero in the conference, and they they benefit from kind of a not an easy part of the schedule, but you know you get Talmadge, you get Roosevelt right off the top, and then you go into your Barberton, your Copleys, and then your Highlands. So their their meat grinder of the of the conference is still coming up. They have an opportunity to you know get some wins and get some points um, on teams. And again, that's why I mentioned all these teams are, are winning or have either a, a five hundred record or winning record because, like Ed mentioned, the secondary points do become a factor in this. And if you know other teams that you beat have some wins over some opponents that maybe that you can build off of, that goes a long way to giving you if you're on the bubble, maybe giving you that edge to get in the playoffs. Um, but yeah, this is this is definitely a fun conference to to cover and you know nothing nothing is Nothing is the same, but everything's kind of the same a little bit. You know, Aurora's always there. Barberton has been pretty good for the last couple of years. Copley's kind of hit and miss, and Highland's got Jake Rogers. And anytime Jake Rogers gets the ball, you might as well just, you know, you can pencil in six points or you can pencil in a big game. But other than that, yeah, that's it from the Suburban American Division. As I said, Jake Rogers is my week four player of the week. And uh, are we going to go right into – our game of the week, which saw the Buckeye, thank God because we're doing the Buckeye recap, guys. Uh, Buckeye Bucks traveling into Lutheran West at home of the Longhorns. And, uh, Rob, tell us what happened in that Buckeye Bucks Longhorn, well, the story, Lutheran West Longhorn. The story was still loading, but I can, oh. I can tell you that um, the game was pretty interesting when it comes to uh, Buckeye. And, and I think when you look at Buckeye, you know, there's still a team that likes to run the football. They do have um, – a very veteran group. I think they rely on uh, Dom Monaco is is a senior running back. And, and you know, when you look at uh, the defense of Buckeye, it was pretty much uh, right from the start. They were forcing Luther and West, uh, their quarterback, Austin Kim, out of the pocket a lot mm -hmm. of times and forcing him all around the place. Um, and in this game, they held Luther and West to two total yards in the first quarter. But the Longhorn defense, they were able to contain the Buckeye offense initially. But the Bucks did get on the scoreboard uh, in the first quarter thanks to a 32-yard touchdown run from senior wide receiver Brock Brumfield. It was 7-0 uh, Buckeye in this game. But then again, Buckeye, they didn't waste any time. As Don Monaco, he plunged into the end zone from three yards out. All of a sudden, it was a 14-0 lead. Uh, with 11.56 in half. Basically, Buckeyes set themselves up in that uh, second quarter. They were down. They actually stopped at about, what, the two- or three-yard line. Yep. Um, 
The quarter ended in the first quarter with 7 nothing Buckeye. They went down the other end. First play, Don Monaco plunged into the end zone. So um, they scored. It was 14 nothing. Then Monaco again would find the end zone on the next possession. Um, for Buckeye, it was a two-yard touchdown run with 9-10 left. It was 21 to nothing Buckeye in this game. Yeah, the you know they had a game plan right from the start. Buckeye did, and it was just a heap, a heap and help on the Don Monaco. It was either on the it was either on the wing, on the outside where they initially found a lot of success. But I mean, that kid is just he's an anvil. He just goes straight in, and when he gets the ball, it's 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 eerily similar to when I saw Jake Rogers. Maybe not as explo- as explosive. Um, he has the ability to do that, but it's just. He's fault. Every time we were up in the press box talking to a couple of their uh, journalists up there, and it was just Lutheran West would initially wrap up, and they would just fall for three, fall for five yards, and it was almost like a three-yard run would end up being a five-yard run and a first down and going forward, and it was just that Lutheran West was being blown off the ball defensively. Um, you know, there was they they were getting penetration, but it was almost like they were getting the penetration that that Buckeye wanted them to, if that makes sense. Like it was, you know, yeah, get penetration on the weak side because we're running to the strong and and vice versa. or We're running around the, 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 around the uh, side. It was interesting to see, you know, the, not, not just the offense on this, but the defense, the defense was hounding all night. I mean, you saw from the field, I saw from out there, from the press box, we were watching the linebackers and defensive linemen getting penetration on Lutheran West all night interrupting, you know, handoffs. Inter- I mean, at one point I thought somebody was going to take the handoff from the quarterback. Yeah, it you know, was. It, it was it was a great defensive effort, you know, for that first almost quarter and a half, two quarters to where, you know, they were getting nothing. They were it was all negative plays and, you until know, until this next play though. Until the next play that Rob's going to, you know, lay out for you. It was uh the Longhorns finally were able to score on an 80-yard throw and catch from Austin Kim to Sean Name. Um, it was 21 to 7 with 8.56 remaining in the second quarter. But then the Bucks quickly responded after that, and it was um, a 16-yard touchdown run by Dom Monaco. At halftime, it was 28-7. to Buckeye um, was leading in the game. We moved to the third quarter where um, it was a pretty slow yeah. third quarter, and, and actually it was 28-7 to for a long time into that third quarter until uh, Buckeye would score it to open the fourth quarter. Um, with uh, Jacob Durge, uh, Durge with a nine-yard touchdown run. And that Buckeye would then lead 35-7 to with 11.54 left in the game. Luther and West, they did score um, one last time with a 42-yard touchdown run by quarterback Austin Kim for the Longhorns. Uh, very impressive as he bounced out to the outside and took it uh, to the end zone. But, um, again, it wasn't enough as Buckeye would win this game 35-14. to the Longhorns, they dropped their first game of the year. They're 3-1 and one on the season, and they'll travel to Wellington, um, who got uh, their first win in a while against uh, New London, as uh, Buckeye um, with a, a pretty big win. And they are looking to host Columbia in Week 5. And, uh, you know, the, after that Revere loss, they really have rebounded. And, you know, I think they were maybe a little bit surprised in that Revere game. They've settled down, and they've won, I think, three in a row now. Well, I – you look at Revere as I, I look at Revere that lost to Revere as maybe a situation where Revere would may have been a better team, um, just maybe with a little bit more talent, better game plan, maybe bigger kids. Um, you know, we certainly the records speak for themselves. I mean, it's not like Revere won that game and then lost every other game. They were putting it on people two weeks after, so maybe it was just one of those things where you know they against Revere they didn't quite match up. But you know, Buckeye does this every year. They take care of business in their in their conference. They're going to continue to do that. This one last year, they're in the Patriot Con- Patriot Athletic Conference um, before they moved to the Great Lakes Conference. Um, and I think, you know, that was some of the discussion up in the press box was, you know, what, you know, why do you, why why would Buckeye move? And I, you know, I kind of was scratching my head like, why wouldn't they move? They've ran roughshod over this conference. They want to play a little bit better competition. They want to be able to get those secondary points and be, you know, not have to be undefeated every year to get in the playoffs. Um, and also, you know, the the teams that they're playing don't prepare them. Pro- I don't think prepare them properly for what they face in the playoffs in their in their particular division and region. Um, to take nothing away from the Patriot Athletic Conference, I, I think it's a hard hitting conference. It's it's a lot of you know smaller ish schools that you know play well, but. 
when when Buckeye goes to play teams in their in in the playoffs, we're seeing that they're not able to, you know, they're may, they it, they're almost shocked by how what happens to them, you know, or the level of play at that end. And maybe it's to some to some end, you know, to some of that is probably just experience in the playoffs. But you know, when you haven't played a team and you're not used to a certain level of competition, and that level of competition is right there. It's it's jarring for some people, and you and what's been working all year may not necessarily work, and they then they have to adapt, and that teams aren't least that. I don't think that's the case here. I think Buckeye has positioned themselves very well to win the division and win specifically win their division and possibly the conference outright, and pre- prepared themselves for possibly a, a playoff run here, uh, because I don't see anyone in their conference really posing that much with that columbia is out there i think that's going to be a pretty good matchup for them next week um you mentioned black river all those teams are you know those are rivalry games uh, but i think buckeye is probably the the clear class of this particular division um and will more than likely end up you know having great success in their last year in the patriot athletic conference before moving to the great lakes conference yeah i mean you're right i mean the patriot the patriot athletic conference is generally at best at best, maybe a three playoff conference, a, a, a three team playoff conference, and mm-hmm. and that depends really on whether Black River a if they beat Buckeye or b if they get enough non conference wins to get into the playoffs. Because once they get into the playoffs, they do some damage usually yeah. because they 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 run that tough uh, th- uh the triple option as well. And then Columbia has long been the the, the class of the uh, of the of the opposite division. But they also have their struggles in the playoffs as well. So, um, I, I think she, to to back your point up, Sean. I think it's a good I, it, it, having joining the Great Lakes Conference. We have the three Parma school. You have four Parma schools there in Holy Name, Parma, Normandy, and Valley Forge. Um, Elyria Catholic is a tough out. Bay is in Rocky River and Fairview. Uh, Bay and Rocky River are, are about as close to perennial playoff contenders as you'll see. Bay is very very good. Um, so Buckeye will get all they can handle from the Bay Rockets uh, as soon as they join that conference as well as the other teams. And they'll be the farthest team in the South. They'll be the only team in the South for that those teams will have to come and play, correct? There's no other team in the Medina County or even Southern correct. Cuyahoga County, really, that uh, that will be there. So, that's I mean, that's definitely a, a plus for them because they can kind of – schedule out a little bit their non-conference um you know playing teams within the Medina County that they don't normally play I, I mean you could maybe perhaps see a Buckeye versus Highland a Buckeye versus you know Brunswick you know at a certain point you never know sometimes the scheduling gets weird uh you know especially those non-conference games but yeah I mean you could definitely see and I could see how this makes a sense for the Buckeye program um and it re- and again to take nothing away from the Patriot Athletic Conference I just think that you know, it makes sense for teams to to switch conferences every now and then, and this makes more sense than than other teams moving, I guess, uh, in the last couple of years. You know, but you know, re- geographically, I understand because they're going to be spending a lot of time in Cuyahoga, Cuyahoga County, specifically with those Parma teams. But again, it's not like they're traveling to like Brunswick to Menor or Brunswick to right. Solon. It's it's you know, it's it's not necessarily you know a two and a half hour both you know round trip. In some in some respects. Well, we had a chance to talk to uh, the Buckeye head coach Greg Dennison, not about the league and the yeah. division, but about the win. And I think he was pretty excited uh, to talk to us after the game. I mean, we knew coming in it was going to be a tough game. I mean, they have a lot of of good skill. They're physical up front. They uh, they do a nice job with what they do and. And uh, we, we were able to do some things and, and get the lead. But, you know, they, they were always competing. And every time they'd make a big play, we'd come back and make one. So it was uh, it, it was a little tighter than, than what I think the final score shows. Talk about Monaco, uh, what he means to you as a senior. Because he, he really takes a lot of the offense and, yeah. and that leadership. And, I mean, I think he had three or four touchdowns tonight. Yeah, and that's what he does every week. And, and uh, he's, he's such a big part of what we do. He's, he, he's, he's Nobody works harder than him. He's got a lot of ability, and uh, he's got a great attitude. He keeps other guys going, and, and, and he knows his role. He knows when, it, when he has to make a play, and he always steps up and makes one. Yeah, so Coach Dennison, uh, you know, he talked a little bit about Monaco and, and also Durgy there, um, but a lot of – Buckeye, I think he was impressed with was, um, I mean, for the most part, I think Buckeye's defense stopped oh, they Luther were dominant. West. But, you know, Luther and West also had a big strike on that 80 yards, and Buckeye's defense didn't fold after that. They really clamped down, and then all of a sudden you saw 
an, an impressive strike from Buckeye right back. So that's what Buckeye gives to you. They just they're they're very fundamentally sound, and if you make mistakes, yeah. they'll make you pay. Yeah, and you know when you look at that eighty yard strike, it was a great throw by Kim. It was a great you know catch. What I will say about that defensively, I, f- I feel like they may have caught Buckeye in the wrong coverage um, or even a blown a blown assignment, I think is what led to that because the guy that caught it, a name, was just, I mean, he caught it in stride wide open and, uh, you know, he he marched it, he went 80 yards on it. And, you know, that, that was the last time I saw a receiver get that open on Buckeye so they made a quick adjustment to that and again it didn't end up hurting them too much in fact it probably gave them an idea that hey this quarterback who who the quarterback for Lutheran West does have some talent especially within the arm uh does allow you know was able to put the ball on you know on the money and he did have some unfortunate drops that may have you know turned the tide of the game but unfortunately that's the way the that's the way the uh the cookie crumbles as they say uh, for our game of the week guys where are we going next week? I mean, that's the issue. That's the question. This People want to know this week, next week, this, this Friday. Week, this Friday, where is Sports on Tap going to be hanging out uh, and covering a game? Well, fellas, we're going to be heading to GCC country. We're going to head out to Elyria, see the new stadium out there as the yeah. Euclid Panthers will travel to Elyria and take on the Pioneers. Uh, it's a big, big game for Elyria. They got to get uh, off the schneid, so to speak. And they shock. Teams in the GCC when they look at the scoreboard and say the Pioneers, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a tough uh, a tough matchup for them as you know Euclid comes rolling in off of a big thirty seven to fourteen victory over Medina uh, and they're playing real well uh, so you know yeah. obviously Euclid's one of the the cream of the crop teams in the GCC so let's hope uh, for our sake when we go out and cover this game and for for those all in attendance that this is a real good game and Alira comes out to play. Yeah, it's going to be a fun game to see the new stadium. Um, you know, they've always had a very nice stadium out there. And, and to see, that it's what, the first time in like 80 years, I think it was. So it's going to be fun to be out there and cover a little GCC. We'll get to see up close and, and personal Euclid and see. They've been so impressive this year. You know, they, they lost the one game on what to Ignatius. But uh, they've really played well this season. And, uh you know, this, hopefully they don't look past this Elyria team because I think Elyria can maybe surprise them. We'll see. Yeah, and, uh, you know, just as an update, an unfortunate update here, uh, the old uh, Vandalia Butler Aviators. <laughs> you know, listen, in my day, we used to beat Northmont by the score they beat us by last last week. It was 43-16. to 16. You know, ample effort, Aviators. Keep your heads up. Move on. Take on Xenia next week. Bounce back. Get yourself right. Uh, but, you know, I just – I mean, if they're going to get themselves right, they need, I think, Sean Duffy in the stands to encourage them, right? I no, mean, I, I think, in fact, I – Or are you just going to give him a phone call? I, I'm the – as much as Jake Rogers is the human cheat code, I'm the human cooler when it comes to football teams. So, if I show up to your game, you're going to lose if you're the <laughs> team that I want to win. So When are you going up to South Bend next? I'm not, I'm not. I'm staying away from South Bend this year. Uh, but I'm hopefully going to get a timeshare in Columbus so I can watch those guys burn in flames. But unfortunately, oh, there we go. Oh, man, here it is. Here comes the mute button. And if you want to see Sean Duffy and talk college football, join uh, Sports on Taps Network uh, yeah. of college football. No. Well, we want to thank everyone for listening yes. tonight and archived on YouTube. Check us out on Twitter, at SOT Podcast. We're on Facebook, Instagram. Check out our website, sportsontappodcast.com. Um, we're also on neosportsinsiders.com, where we have all kinds of high school sports there as well. I um, want to thank everyone for listening. Guys, any uh, last thoughts before we leave? A uh, big thank you to yep. Fayetteville Perry head coach Kevin Finch and the Rockets down there. Uh, 4-0 going into their big game against Batavia, trying to get into some uh, playoff positioning. Uh, good luck to Coach Finch and the Rockets. Yeah, it'll good be fun to, to see. Good luck to Allen Robinson, Jr. of the uh, Chicago Bears. I need you, buddy. Need you. And thank you to Khalil Mack, the defense of the Chicago Bears. All right, we're going to wrap it up tonight on Sports on Tap. Thanks, everyone, for uh, checking in tonight and listening. Uh, for Rob Trotman, Shaw Duffy, Ed Dick, I'm Josh Avery. We'll see you guys at the fields on Friday, and we'll be right back here at 7.30 next week on Mixler. Take care, everyone.